In the early 90s, Squaresoft director Tetsuya Takahashi began writing a scenario for a game that was to begin development. That game was the yet-to-be-created Final Fantasy VII. However, after it was judged to be too dark and too complicated for a Final Fantasy title, Takahashi was given the go-ahead to turn this scenario into its own project, which would go on to become Xenogears. Several years of planning, creating backstory, and development ensued, and in February of 1998, Xenogears was released in Japan, coming over to the States later on that year in October, although it very nearly didn't. Today, we take a look at the first game in the larger Xeno franchise, the critically acclaimed Xenogears, next on Downloadable Content. Welcome to Downloadable Content, I am Brian, and with me we have, from the depths of Kisarith Studios, we have Tanya! Hello! And only Tanya! It is the Brian and Tanya show today. Ron is buggered off somewhere. <laughs> Woo! Just you and me. So it's just gonna be, you know, an hour and a half or two hours of Tanya and Brian-fueled craziness. Oh god, it's help everybody. <laughs> oh, you, you, you've been warned. You have absolutely been warned. On your own head, be it. That's, you know, listening to this podcast, that's, uh, you know, there's, there might be a health warning in there. But <laughs> but yes, we have Tanya from Kisarath with me today talking about Xenogears. But before we dive into this discussion, just want to remind everyone out there that every single episode of downloadable content can be found on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, Google Play Music, as well as our website, dlcpodcast.com. Uh, we have a couple more episodes coming up after this one to finish out 2018. So if you would like to check out the recording schedule, um, you are welcome to join in. You're also feel free to request ideas for future episodes. I'm going to start preparing our start of 2019, our ninth season before long. So if you have any topics that you want us to talk about, let us know. Click on the feedback button and uh, we'll see if we can get to that. So dlcpodcast.com. So Xenogears is the subject of today's episode. It's 20th anniversary. And, you know, it's it was a very, very critically acclaimed JRPG and one that I had owned for about 10 years or so before I finally dove into it. Oh, wow. It, it was one of those games that I picked up when I was in high school. And for whatever reason, it was one of those games that I just would start and then stop. Start and then stop. Start yep. and then stop. And, you know, the, the, I had gone too long in between each stoppage to actually remember what the hell happened. So I would always have to restart. And then finally, a few years ago, I just said, you know what? Fuck. I've had this game. I've had the discs for 10 years. I'm just going to just plow straight through it. Yeah. It's tough to do too. <laughs> it's very tough to do, but having, having played. Um, the, the Xeno Saga trilogy and the first Xenoblade Chronicles, I had a little bit of an idea of what I was going to get into. <laughs> yeah. Especially Xenoblade. That's a, that's a long game right there. That's a long game. And the Xeno Saga trilogy, and I knew that going into Xenogears, you would have to brush up on your Nietzsche and your Jungian philosophy. Yeah. Because, while 
Xenoblade and Xenosaga have the benefit of voice acting, um, playing Xenogears is like reading a philosophy textbook. <laughs> oh, There's a so lot of reading. <laughs> There, the, the, yeah, it, there is a lot. That is one thing. Is there's a lot of reading in that game, and it's. I, I think you will agree. I mean, you love this game. This is a critically acclaimed game. Um, oh, it's a masterpiece. At least in my it's, view, it's definitely a it's, masterpiece. It's, it's you know, and for a lot of people, it is. Uh, I'm kind of not as enthralled about it for various reasons, um, and we'll we'll dive into those. Um, but just before we get too heavily involved, um, it's, this is, it, it's been 20 years, but I will throw up the obligatory spoiler alert. <laughs> there just will be in case. Sp- spoilers about in case, you know, it's been 20 years. You, I mean, you might want to play it. Um, if you do, stop listening right now. Go and play it, and then we'll see you in about 80 hours. <laughs> Seriously, it's a long, <laughs> long game. And then come back here and listen to us blither about it. So you have been warned, spoilers abound. So, oh yeah, if you if if you listen beyond this point, it's it's on your it's on your own head, and uh, we're not responsible. No, no, no. And if any damage results to your to your sand or anything like that, then we're not responsible for that either. You know, basically. So. <laughs> So, you know, you dive right in, you know, you start the game, you immediately start off with uh, a a cutscene that initially, as you delve into the game, it, it, it appears that it has nothing to do with the game. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, that is true. Like, you start off with this cutscene, you know, there's a, you know, your people are on this gigantic ship. I think it's called the Eldridge. Yep. And... You know, things are going along, and then suddenly the ship just goes berserk. You see messages appearing on screen in true anime fashion. The phrase, ye shall be as gods, just repeated over and over and over again. Ah, such an iconic scene. Which, I, (laughs) when I was playing this game, I'm like, okay, this is starting off like every single anime I've ever watched. (laughs) Here's a scene that has that will not be important until 300 hours in. <laughs> it, it does kind of actually have that concept to it, which actually, it is a very anime RPG too. So absolutely, yeah. all yeah. all the cutscenes are. Yeah, yeah, it's a very anime RPG, and not just in style, but also in terms of content too. It's. You know, so you get that, it crash lands, and then there's this woman, this purple-haired woman, uh, that just rises from the destruction. And out of all this destruction, the game just sort of does a, does a jump cut to somebody painting. <laughs> well, actually, before that, it, it does, it, 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 it shows, uh... It shows what well. What you don't know at first is a vision of, of battling of gears, battling of fi- big yes. fighting machines. You know. Yep. Battling, and then it goes into oh, by the way, that was a dream sequence, and no, now you're <laughs> now, now, now you're now, now, now you're painting. Like, all right, that's some whiplash right there. But you know, the game starts off. You, you're introduced to this character named uh, Fei Fong Wong. I do love that uh, name, Fei Fong Wong, with. Um, that one little strand of hair that's constantly in his eye that I hate so much from a stylistic point of view. <laughs> like, 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 doesn't that fucking annoy you? It would be. <laughs> it, 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 it did for a long time, and then I got over it. I was just like, I've seen it so often. I was like, okay, that's just me. <laughs> yes. So, the game actually kind of kind of reminds me, at least the start of the game, Kind of reminds me of the start of Wild Arms. You have this, uh, mm. you have this individual. You have this guy who has been accepted by this village because he arrived in this village through unknown or, or mysterious circumstances. You find out that um, Faye was brought to the village as a child um, by a, um, well, not necessarily not. Yeah, he was a child by a yeah. masked man. 
Um, you find out he has amnesia. There you go. Clean slate. We can do anything with him. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's a, I love that trope. I do. <laughs> it happens so often. I mean, this game is like tropey McTrope face. It's oh, like yeah, you want... I was going to say, absolutely. Yeah, no, it, you're absolutely right. And if you're not a fan of tropes, you're not going to like this game that much. <laughs> <laughs> this okay this i mean because of the the there are some tropes in jrpgs that i absolutely loathe and this game has them in buckets mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's part of my my reason part of my my reasons for for this game being eh on my on my like scale but <laughs> we'll get to that uh, you find out that there's a, there's a war going on. There's a war going on between the the uh, the, the countries of Kislev mm -hmm. and Ave. I always find it funny how people how people uh, pronounce the the names in this game and the and the pronouns and whatnot. I always find it interesting because like um, I always say Ava. Isn't that interesting? You know, the game doesn't give a pronunciation, so, I mean, you're free to pronounce it however you like. They look very, the names look very, uh, very Hebrew. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They, and, and this game heavily, uh, borrows from Judaism and Christianity both. A lot of JRPGs do. In this, in this case, this game, uh, it delves. It's, it's it's weird because it has moments where a lot of moments where it, it delves very deeply into the religious aspects of uh, Hebrew and and, Ju and Judeo Christian and Judeo Christian uh, Christian uh, mythology and whatnot. But then there are times when it's anti-religion, and it kind of just comes down your throat a little bit and goes, "No, fuck your religion. This is what we actually have to say about that." <laughs> And well, I mean, the whole idea that this game brings up about killing God. Oh you know, yeah, that's... The, the, the the protagonist, the, the the final boss, Deus. Mm -hmm. um, Which means God. Of, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, right there. Yeah. Because of all of the religious symbolism in this game, um, that was a large reason why it almost never made it to this country. Because it was felt that all of the censoring and translating changes that were going to have to be done to appease the religious fanatics in the United States. Oof. Yeah, there, there, was, there was quite a bit of controversy over Xeno Gears. Yeah, there was. It's, you know, one of the, the translators for this game... Um, you know, when he was trying to translate from, from the Japanese to, to English, he's just looking at this and going, ooh, that's going to piss off the religious right if we put, you know, killing God and <laughs> all that. Oh, there's going to there's gonna be some blaspheming going on. and uh... But they managed to work around it. Oh, actually, yeah. I have to say they did so pretty effectively, too. I mean, uh... They got their central tenets and their messages across with the translation, even though, and I, I believe it was just one man who did the translation for all of that. Now, keep in mind, folks, we're talking, this, this game has a lot of dialogue, and I believe only one man had to, had to translate it and do it. That's a lot of work, <laughs> so I give him props. <laughs> Richard Honeywood was his name, and uh, yep. he. Th this was his first project at Square. Oh God, we thrown into the frying pan there. <laughs> the reason why uh, he got saddled with this game, because the reason why he got saddled with translating this game was because all of the other translators quit or asked to be reassigned due to how hard it was. Yeah, this this was no easy. The, nothing about this game was easy. Nothing, not the translation. Nothing. It, it there was one thing that I can say that uh, that Taka that, that that Takahashi did. Takahashi, I can't even say his name right, but Takahashi. Takahashi, thank you. 
if there's one thing I can say about Takahashi is that uh, this am very ambitious game, which was never fully completed, really, I mean, when you think about it, taken in context, especially the second disc, it was never fully completed the way it ought to have been. It was so ambitious for its time that Takahashi, he was ahead of its time when it came to this game, and asking for so much, it, it, it's almost like, it's like an impossible situation when you really look at it. Like, how could he have even approached the level of ambition that he wanted for this game without there being major cuts to it at this point? Especially at that point in gaming. I mean, we're talking 1998 here. That was that was crazy, you know? Yeah, and, 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 you know, that, that that is one of my criticisms of the game is that it feels very unfinished. Um, especially I mean, the difference between disc one and disc two is night and day. Um, whereas disc one, you have this very sprawling RPG, very involved, very deep, you know, just story and, and gameplay. Whereas the second disc, it's just basically a interactive movie. <laughs> it, the With, second disc really is it's like it's like a virtual novel it really is it really is and you know he did explain takahashi did explain why that happened it was because he ran out of time he ran out of time because uh, the at the time the square development cycle was okay from the time development officially begins you have two years that's all you get and honestly and, Dino Garris, i think it needed like five <laughs> He he had two years and uh, you know a certain a certain budget and that's all he was gonna get, and that's why the game ended the, the way it did. You know that's why we got what we got because initially you know when they were running short of time, the the higher ups at Square initially suggested just end the game when the uh, the party has to flee Solaris at the end of disc one, and. Takahashi felt that that would have been a very bad place to end the game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would have been And I don't actually. blame him. I don't <laughs> blame him. So, to be able to fit at least the narrative ideas that he wanted to have absolutely in the game, that's why Disc 2 um, was what it was, and which is very unfortunate because, you know... Yeah, for all of its its storytelling, um, you know, I play that. If you play that now, you play and you, and you might wind up with the same sort of criticism. Like, wait a minute, this is an unfinished game. What the hell, Square? Yeah, and, that is true. Yeah, and which might not have been. I I feel that I played this game too late. Uh, I didn't play it in 1998 when I got it, <laughs> and or, or shortly after that, because in all that time, you know, I've played JRPGs. I've, I've, you know, as I've played JRPGs, there are tropes that I have fallen in love with, tropes that I have hated, and playing this game in 2015, finally, I'm going through this and I'm going. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Tropy Vikman, you know, there are two tropes that I hate in the two biggest ones in JRPGs that I hate, and this game has them all over the place. Um, the first um, happens in Metal Gear Solid. Uh, that's the whole repeat what the last person said, but in the form of a question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that happens a lot in Xeno Gears. <laughs> that happens so... And I don't know what's worse, ha having it voice acted in Metal Gear Solid or seeing it in text on a screen because in Metal Gear Solid, you can bypass every single codec conversation with the press of a button. Uh, here I am just mashing X, just getting like... Here's, you know, Saitan with a gigantic expo dump and then Faye's like, Question? <laughs> And I'm just like, I, yeah, like, and I'm just like, oh come on, just get through the damn. 
So that's the first one. The second one uh, has the, the second one is the Deus Ex Machina trope. The uh, there are many points in this game where the party members should, by all means, be dead. <laughs> oh God, yeah. Oh God, yes. Yeah. There are so many places where the that Faye and Ellie and all them. There are so many places where the antagonists should win. But they get saved at the last second by the most bizarre, inexplicable means. Like, okay, I can see that happening maybe once, but I think this is, happens like five or six times, and I'm like, oh dear god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that the Deus Ex Machina does happen quite a bit in Xeno Gears. It does. It happens so much, and I'm just like, okay. You know, once or twice you might get lucky. This is just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, you know, Faye, Faye should be dead a dozen times over by now. <laughs> oh, I agree. I do agree. But and, and I guess maybe for me, and again, I absolutely, I adore this game. I do yeah. all of its flaws. I adore it. And and I think the reason is is I did play it back in 1998 when it first came out, and I was 16 when it first came out. So I think I was 16. Yeah, I think I was 16. And so I was still a kid, and I remember playing it. And I remember it just blew. I mean, I mean, honestly, and it, for its time, it even still kind of holds up a little even today. The graphics for its time were amazing. I mean, the 2D sprites, the 3D lush landscapes and the gears and mm -hmm. everything, for its time, it was... You couldn't find a better, a, a more better looking game other than Chrono Cross, maybe. You know, it was it was absolutely beautiful, Xenogears. Um, and, and, and I still have a soft spot for PlayStation graphics to this day. I always will, but... Um, but really... What it boils down to is that, for me at least, is I had never the way that the tropes were 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 shown to me. Now I had been playing RPG games for a while. By that point, I was introduced to the original Final Fantasy, Nintendo, and Dragon Quest, or Dragon Warrior at that time. And I was playing uh, DQ7 on, on PlayStation. I was playing uh, Final Fantasy 7 and whatnot. And you know, I, and and I remember. I had a good number of RPGs in my belt. The SNES era, I was playing all the Final Fantasies, pretty much. But, like, I remember playing this, and the way that the tropes were presented, even though they were, especially the amnesia thing, that was like, okay, whatever. But I, it was presented to me at that point in time in such a way that I had not really seen before. There was a, there was a certain hook to it all that you didn't, uh, you didn't see before, just the way the presentation was. It's like, okay, yeah, we've seen the amnesia trope before, but this was presented a little differently. There was something different about this game. And I remember thinking that as I played it through the first time, and now, of course, I was blown away, not just by the graphics, but the story. I mean, it, it, it just... I mean, and, I, and again, you don't really... You, you find it meh, you know, and for good reasons, too, but... For me, the story, especially in conjunction with a, a thing called Perfect Works, which happens after, uh, after which, which came out at, way after the game was released, uh, it's basically a, a a compendium of everything that goes on uh, from past to present, uh, all of the episodes basically within the the universe that is Xenogears. And I've read it, I've read through that several times, and it really fills in all the gaps, but the story is beyond top-notch. The story is a masterpiece. If you take it apart the way I did, and what I mean by that is you kind of, and this is going to sound kind of weird, but you got to take the Japanese translation, the translation itself kind of out of your head, and look at it in terms of the overall story. And if you can do that, then you'll go, holy shit, this story is amazing. It's a masterpiece. Takahashi is a genius. The guy is an absolute genius. And then you read Perfect Works, and 
you go, you go, he had all this in his head? Really? So, for me, and Brian, I know that you have your qualms with the game, and that, and they're very legit qualms, I might add, too. The game is not without its flaws, definitely not, but there are aspects to the story which made me go, huh, like, I had never seen, and, I, I'm, gonna, and I'm actually going to ask you the same question, have you ever had a game to that point ever have the main character have DID? I would have to know what DID means. Uh, Disassociative Identity Disorder, or Multiple Personality Disorder, as it used to be called. Um, at the, I cannot recall too many characters um, with that particular condition in a video game. That Faye might be an exception there, and you know, absolutely. With uh, as you you find out later, uh, all of uh, how id came to be. Yeah, and of course it's peppered throughout the story. And that's another thing too is the build up. I love the build up, especially in the first disc of id of graph of just the build up to how even though even though i mean i'm even as a kid i knew who it was after the first scene almost i was like okay that's, yeah that that's Faye. but yeah but even then i was like but i enjoyed the build up i enjoyed the build up because of all the events just they all just locked into place in my mind, and and, and it's just the way it was presented. Uh, it, it was a fantastic build-up, and you got to really know these characters throughout. So when it was finally revealed, you know, that big reveal at the end of Solaris there, that, you know, for the characters to know that it, it, that, it, that it is Faye and Faye and, it, and Faye is it, especially for Ellie, for me... It was almost like I was re-experiencing that all over again, even though I had already deduced this back in the first scene of the damn game. But I remember that I was able to re-experience that because of all the prior events that led up to it. It was just, it was, the build-up is fantastic in this game. I can't say enough about that. Um, but again, you got to take the story and you got to kind of disseminate it in your mind, which... I know it doesn't sound too too great to do, but if you you got to do that because if, if if you just look at the story the way it's presented to you as is, and you just kind of go, okay, and you look at the dialogue as is, and you don't kind of go over in your mind and kind of just do a do a retranslation in your mind, then yeah, you got to kind of play the game through at least two or three times before you actually get all of it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, as I said, you know, at the at the start, it's a very, very heavily laid game. And yes, you know, for all of its 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 tropey McTrope von tropeness, um <laughs> yes, there is it there is a lot of, of build up, it's a it's a, a lot of slow burn. And yeah, you thought I mean, you as the player know who it is after, you know, Faye goes berserk for the first time. It's like, okay, you know who it is. Yeah. It was and, easy, and, you know, for some of the other characters who witness this, who don't have a clue, you know, I'm playing this and I'm going, really, guys? Really? <laughs> you just watched, you, you saw this happen. Really? The only one who knows is Saitan, because mm -hmm. Saitan is like the all-knowing everything. He, to me, was the most interesting character of the game. Oh, I agree. I, 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 I fully agree with you on that one. Saitan is, he's also the biggest asshole, too, of the game. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Saitan is both, you know, wonderful and amazing and also the biggest prick. <laughs> he really is, too. Oh, especially, but it makes him... especially when you find out all of the shit he's doing behind the scenes. Oh, God. Oh, God, because yes. He is, because he's not who he, he, he says he is. <laughs> no, he, and, and I love the multi-dimension to his character. It's, it's just, like, and at one point when you think he's betrayed the entire party, you're just like, I'm gonna fuck you up next time I see you, you know? <laughs> And then, oh, oh, I was, I was being, I was a double agent type deal. Oh, okay, huh. Yep, you were double and triple crossed. Congratulations. Oh, God, it, it, he, he, 
he was a fantastic asshole. He really was. And as a character, I mean, in, in battle especially, dude, his speed in battle, the best. Freaking yes. love his speed in battle. If you have Saitan in your team, you're good. <laughs> oh, he was, he, he, was, he was constantly in my party whenever I could have it. No, you're there. Like yeah, you're just definitely. gonna stay there, but you know you like you know you start off you know you meet him and he's you know you find he he's the local doctor and you know everyone loves his wife's cooking. Um, <laughs> Yui, <laughs> yes, and you know you find and you know, like your first real clue that he isn't you know it's like how the fuck do you know everybody like. He has a history with so many of the characters, like Ramses and Sigurd and Jesse and. Oh yeah! Oh God, and, yeah! And it's like, how the? Wait, wait a minute! You're this small country doctor. How do you know all this shit? <laughs> you know, and, and I think there was a couple of lines in, during the Kislev portion of the game. Uh, where something like even Faye was starting to to go, you know, well, well, Doc seems to know a lot, and the other doctor there that he was replacing, the 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 the, the, the female doctor there, the NPC doctor, she was like, okay, like, okay, how does he know all this, you know? And then it's like, aha, he's actually he, he's actually not of this world. <laughs> no. He he used to be part of Solaris, and and that reveal was was big on its own. But then you come to find out that you know he was basically basically assigned to watch over Faye because of Id. And when you when you see that, especially when when Faye slash Id is all you know uh, is all uh, 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 paralyzed in that room there, and you see him talking to Id, and it's like. Holy damn! This guy is this guy is brutal. This guy is ruthless. Uh huh. You know, but it makes me appreciate the character more because it just it just gives him so much dimension. I will say, out of all the characters in this game, Saiten has the most dimension out of any of them. He really does. He absolutely does, and you know. When he tags after after the incident in Lahan, where he you know, he finds this this Faye finds this rogue gear and you know somehow knows how to pilot it, like hmm, uh, <laughs> really, um, you know he he's he's he also serves as the narrative. He, he's sort of like the go-between between the player and the game. Like, oh, yes, he, he's, he is the exposition. Yeah, he is. He is the walking exposition person. He really is. But I guess it works for him, when, though. It, it does, especially when you get out of the hand and you go into the desert. And you're going, oh, and he's like, oh, we should go meet the, the ethos. Oh, yeah, the ethos, yeah. Ah, uh, yes, the super shadowy religious Thing which oversees all gear development and scientific advances. Like, wait a minute, you have a ch it, this this group is a church. Well, what, there's a, it's a front, is what it is. Yeah. Yes, it, yes. You find out it's obviously you find out it's a front, but it's like, but wait a minute, this you have this church, but they oversee the science and the, the and then you find ah. Ha, ha, ha. I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's that's a central tenet of Xeno Gears is there's a lot about oppression and control, and I, and I hate to say this, but even nowadays, it's probably one another reason why I could play the game even today and kind of have a relation to it. There's a, there's some parallels actually with in terms of control and oppression depicted in the game to even today. Uh, Say's political climate, and not just in this country, but in other countries as well. And you know, fascism, the alt right. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of parallels even today. Which, I mean, take from it what you will. Whether it's whether you know you know that the fact that a, a game released in 1998 can have parallels in 
and even um, you know relatability. Twenty years later, that that says something. <laughs> Basically, yeah, that's uh, you know that's when you ha when you are able to do that. That's that's still a, a mark of a pretty good game. Yeah, uh, you know, and 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 again, Brian, I I know you're not a big fan of Zeno Gears, and that's and you have the best reasons too. Let me tell you. But I think I, I think I think even those who are not like I am about the game, I think even those who 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 play it, it's an experience. It's not just a game like any other game. It really is an experience, whether you like it or you or you hate it or you just kind of like it a little bit or you just, some access to me you can and throw your you know pull your hair out. It's. It's an experience that I think people should really play it in order to really to really experience what it is because it it, it kind of transcends the the usual gaming for me. I don't know about for you, but definitely for me. Well, it definitely isn't Final Fantasy. That's for damn sure. That's <laughs> no. <laughs> and ultimately, it was why Takahashi left Square to form Monolith Soft. Um, because you know, one of his biggest drives for creating Xenogears was that he was he gotten tired of Final Fantasy, and when it became clear, even after this game came out, when it became clear that Square was going to put more and more of its focus on Final Fantasy, uh, he left because he wanted to continue the Xeno story. And he realized that Square wasn't going to allow him to do that. Yeah, and that's, that's and, and, you know, it's kind of a, of a what could have been type thing. Like, I wonder, you know, if, if Square had actually been fully supportive of the Xeno franchise, you know, would we have gotten all the episodes as he envisioned? I think he envisioned like nine episodes in total, I believe. Something six. like that. Six? Six. Yes. Yeah, he yeah, envisioned six. Episodes. And Square said that they could give him a sequel if Xenogears sold a million copies. Uh, they got about 900,000. Ah! <laughs> so, so, we got the Xenosaga trilogy uh, after he left and went and created Monolith Soft. So. And, and I mean, as a, I played the Xeno Saga trilogy, of course, and I mean one and three are my faves. That's 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 out of that trilogy. That's 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 definite. But like, you, I mean, the, there is a, there is quite a bit of Xeno Gears influence and whatnot in those games. But you could tell uh, it's almost it's almost like you know you, it's almost like Xeno Xeno Saga is like the middling child going into Xeno Blade. You know, do you have a uh, you have these games which kind of which kind of connect to Xenogears, but kind of don't either. And then you go into Xenoblade, which has themes that are relevant to the Xeno series that came before it, but it's a whole it's its own animal. So it's yeah, you know, and, and you can kind of see where they were going with that and where he was going with that. But it makes me wonder though, what could have been? Yeah, and you know, maybe we will, maybe you'll get an eventual sequel to Xenogears, but who knows? Who knows? You know. Well, we've been or talking we'll get... about. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Like we've been talking about uh, Faye and Saitan. I'm like we have other characters to dive into. Uh, oh, we God. have Ellie. Ellie. Yep. Yep. Ellie, who you fr you are introduced to uh, shortly after Faye leaves the home village um, after ruining the town and disrupting and and. Um, Everything really. Uh, <laughs> I will never. I will never forget. Uh, after the destruction of of La, uh, Lahan, uh, little Dan. Oh God, and how Dan! Angry he is <laughs> because he, because his sister his sister died. Yeah. Yep. His sister died at Faye's hand. So, Alice. Yeah, Alice. Yes, okay. Alice. So, he is so angry with Faye, and when you see him again in a tournament, 
<laughs> like, wow. <laughs> like, wow, you, you traveled all that way just to get try to get revenge on him? Wow, that, you know, spite will go a long way. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, but actually spite is is a very prominent thing in Xenogears, it really yes. is. Ab absolutely, so, you know, you find Ellie, and the way the game uh, narratively treats the introduction makes you immediately say, ah, she's going to be important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 I believe when you first meet her, she's pointing a gun to your head, and, you yeah. know, and and she's and she's calling you a lamb, which you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah, and the the word lamb is in quotes. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 um the the translator, and I and I and I know why he did it, of course. But the translator, he had to use words that mean other words a lot. You know, like lamb means this, and this means that, but. You don't know it. The player doesn't know it until probably way later. But like, you know, he, there's a lot of words that mean other things that you've never really heard of in that particular context. So there's a lot of quotations used and a lot of hyphens. A hyphens is big in that game. <laughs> yes. You know, quotes, so quotes and hyphens and all of that. So I mean, like, yeah, you you, you meet her and she's. She's pretty, you know, I mean, you know, you can kind of be like, okay, she's definitely going to be a main character. But you don't know to the extent that she's going to be so integral to the plot. She basically is the plot to Zeno Gears. Yes. I mean, in this, in the initial meeting, she's just this, this Gebler soldier. Uh, there's some discussion about the, this, this gear that Faye was in. Because right now that's that's sort of the MacGuffin to drive the plot forward here, um, but um, eventually, uh, then you meet Graf. Oh, I love Graf. I love his music. Ah, uh. and Graf. <laughs> Graf is just initially he's just this power-hungry dipshit who just keeps showing up. <laughs> He's the just, he's the Gilgamesh of Xeno Gears. <laughs> he, he he's just he's just because he's just this this masked dude that's just shows <laughs> up like what do you want? What's this whole I'm the seeker of power and you know you have hidden powers and you know grant unto thee the power of the glorious mother of mother of destruction. <laughs> What are you rambling on about? <laughs> I am Graf, the seeker of power. Doth thou desire the power? Yeah, I'm just like, what are you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I and and I love I love and every time he enters into a scene, pretty much almost every time he enters into a scene, especially where you're going to be going going up against a boss, uh, he'll empower the uh, the boss that you're gonna face pretty much with like his own power, but like I, I love I love how he does the same thing each time you know and, and you hear in his entry you can just tell because you before even before the music starts and and I gotta say the the soundtrack in this game is amazing uh, they just had their 20th anniversary uh, uh, they just had 20th anniversary orchestra orchestrated. Uh, 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 soundtrack for this game. It is so wonderful. I just, I listen to it. I will amazing. have to get it. I mean, obviously, we, we haven't even talked. I mean, it's Yasunori Mitsuda. You're not yeah. gonna go wrong. Yeah, no. Mitsuda is amazing. Um, but, you know, every time he, every time Graf enters, you have these metallic noises. You go, choo -choo, choo -choo, and then, da -da. and then you see the, the flamey energy coming up from from behind him and you see him in his gear or or even like on top of his gear you know and then you have the music that starts playing and he goes and he always says i am gruff the speaker of power dost thou desire the power <laughs> like, my I name is inigo it. montoya you killed my father <laughs> prepare to die it was great <laughs> and just and then you know Graf is just you're like who is this who is this jerk that just keeps showing up 
and you eventually find out that he is the personification of of Lacan, uh, which has tra- transferred through pe- you know various people throughout time, and you know is connected to Faye because of course, and you know. He just wants... All Groff wants is to just awaken the weapon Deus, and he he just wants to get revenge. (laughs) Well, actually, he wants more than that. He wants to to awaken God so he can destroy it, so then then he can destroy everything. Yes. Because that makes sense. Sure. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) And he he figured out how to pass on uh, from body to body, and you know, basically just granting himself eternal life. Because so- Faye is the reincarnation uh, of of Lacan. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Just just uh, much in the same way Ellie is a reincarnation, just over and over and over again. Um, Bars. Bart. Oh, love that pirate. <laughs> he is like the 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 YOLO character of the game. He's he has this ship, this desert this, that can go under the sand. What, what's it? The Yggdrasil? Yggdrasil, yep. Yep, there you go. Stealing from Norse mythology square again. Um <laughs> And he's just, he's, he is the rightful heir to the throne of Ave. And you find out why he's in the situation he's in. I, I like his, uh, what, he has his, he has Sigurd and he has one other character. Uh, um, um, Mason. Thank or you. Or Mason. I think, I forget, I forget how it is, but I think it's, yes. I say Mason, but yeah. Uh, yeah th- that's his, that's his long-suffering servant. <laughs> I, I've always liked my, uh, M- Mason. I always liked him. He was, he was a cool guy. He just had an air of, oh god, the child. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, he's he's being excitable again. Oh, yes, young master. What now? What? Just the long suffering. And, and whenever Bart. Bart was very impulsive. Whenever, whenever Bart would get into a battle situation, whether warranted or not, whenever he would get into a battle situation, you know, he was usually either in over his head, he hit, he hit, he hit the right target at the wrong time, or he's going after the wrong person at the wrong time at the wrong, you know, and just everything's wrong. There's never really a time when Bart actually makes a correct decision that is at the right time at the right place with the right people <laughs> that happens later on but definitely in the early going here you know he's this sort of he's he's a very hot-headed character he's oh, a very hot-headed character <laughs> yep and you know he he's in, he he's in exile because uh Shakan uh, caused a coup d'etat while he was younger. And both he and uh, his younger cousin Margie were um, eventually rescued by Sigurd and Mason, and they escaped. Um, although I totally forgot about this. Um, well, first of all, he's unique in that his weapons of choice in the game are whips. Yes. Yes. That's typically not something you see assigned to a male character. No, which I thought not. was interesting. You know, usually a, a whip will be associated with a female character. Yep. But um, you find out that you know, he was tortured by Shakan. And he learned how to use whips um, to cure his phobia. Oh yeah, being of being whipped. Yeah, of being yeah. of being whipped. So he learned how to use whips. Sigurd taught him how to use whips. 
and and really just even knowing that that does bring more dimension to the character which is great you know but i never really maybe it's just me but i never really related to bard at all he was just kind of okay he's the hot-headed guy who's just kind of there yeah he's just a, he's an 18 year old just He's an 18-year-old hot-blooded guy. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yes. So, I mean, I didn't I didn't use him much in battle, but eventually when he finally takes back um when he takes back Ava, when Shikan gets defeated, that's a nice bit of redemption for him. It is. It, and it's it's satisfying. You know, and, and I like that he abdicated the throne and chose instead to do uh, a democratic republic of, of Ave instead of a monarchy. So I thought that was really, that was a nice little, little thing there. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. And his, and his, his loving devotion to Margie. Oh, uh, okay. If there's one character, no, it's this one of two characters. I can't stand. It's Margie. I hated Margie. <laughs> okay, there's some issues here that we need to work through here. Um, <laughs> she is, uh, um, uh, as far as I recall, Margie, I mean, yes, Margie is, is important to the game because she is the reigning holy mother of, of Nissan. Yep. Yeah. She's the reigning holy mother at, at 16 years old here. Um, she's Bart's first cousin and, um, she str always struck me as a bit of a Pollyanna character, always seeing the positive to the point of naivety. I think that's probably why I couldn't stand her. <laughs> It was, like, it was, why are you why are you so young and full of hope? You know, I, I mean, <laughs> you should be hard. You should be hardened, embittered. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, she should have been like a battle hardened badass by that point. But instead, she's just, oh, I need to know. Oh, 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 oh. And I'm just like, gag me with a spoon. <laughs> well, you need to have one in every JRPG. Oh. She, 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 okay, you know what? Margie is the vanille of Xenogears. There we go. That is an excellent comparison. I like that. Yep. Yep, Margie is the vanille of Xenogears. And I hate, and I, I can't stand vanille. And I, I hate that game in general, but I can't stand vanille. So there we go. Yep, yep, that works pretty well. Oh my god. I, I just, and I know they tried to give her a little bit more depth by the end of the game. But... I just, every time there was a scene with her, I just, I turned my brain off because I couldn't stand it. Ugh. Ugh. It's like I'm in this, ba in, in bad, in, in, you know, this, this bitter, embattled world, and there's wars going on, and there's subterfuge and political plots, and all this is going on, and kidnappings, and this and that, and then you have her being all, I am overly positive all the time oh god and and her uh familiar her her sidekick character choo choo okay and she and, and she choo choo is the second character that i can't stand so i guess that works oh choo choo i sort of i saw as as the is the kate sith of xenogears Another character I can't stand. Okay. Yeah, Tai Chi. Yeah, I hate that one yeah. too. Just, just absolutely, just no. But uh, oh, well, she, 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 and Bart are the last living descendants of the of the Fatima line. Yep. And yeah, uh, I, I, I don't remember. It's like I think her and Bart have an arranged marriage, despite the fact that they're first cousins. And I went, hmm. <laughs> yeah, that was a little Game of Thronesy at that point. <laughs> but, you know. a, a, a drop, just <laughs> just a skosh. Uh, and 
you know, here we are, we're talking about the characters here. We haven't even gotten to really the plot. I just think if we if we'd gotten to the plot, we will just be here for days. Oh god. Um, yeah. But um we will talk about one more character before we cut to break, because it's been almost an hour. Um after meeting Faye and Groff and, and Bart, um, you've got uh, Wise Man. Wise Man. Who you who Wise Man, whom whom uh, is just he is he is the masked man who brought Faye to Lahan. And you find out that bit of, of information and you find out that Wise Man is actually Groff. <laughs> and, and Khan too at the same and time. Khan, and Khan! Khan! And Khan! Uh, <laughs> and so you have Griezmann. Uh, Griezmann, wow. Grise- uh, <laughs> that was great, Brian. That there you great. go. Uh, that was good. Wise Man, <laughs> Groff, and Khan Wong. Um, so Groff, Wise Man, and Khan are all three facets of Faye's father. <laughs> yeah, that, that there's a lot going on with, with Faye's dad. Yeah. So, you, I mean, we mentioned that Faye has, has you know, split personality. So does dad! <laughs> yeah, except it, in Faye's case, it's, it's he's got id, and he's got, yep. and, and he's got the coward, and he's got the Faye that we come to know. And... You know, and then we have another three. We have, you know, we have Khan, who's Khan. Then we have, you know, the Fey Daddy. And then we have Graf, who slips into his body after uh, Khan confronted Graf. And then we have Wise Man, who Khan presents himself as to avoid being known as Khan. Ah! <laughs> yeah, because that isn't confusing at all. <laughs> not not in the slightest so you know so wise man Graf Khan all the same character whew that's a lot to digest <laughs> especially how all three came to be so um the part of the game that I would usually stop at and just um I'd lose interest sometimes was um when Faye gets captured and goes to the prison in Kislev, uh, in in Nortun. Oh, Nortun, yeah. That's that's where you, that's where you meet Wise Man. But it was like that whole section where you have to um, fight to gain your freedom. That was sort of where I lost interest time and time again. This is you know after meeting Hammer. And Antonio, I mean Rico Banderas. <laughs> yeah, Rico, Rico, Green Man, the Hulk. Green Man, the demi, the demi human. Yes, the demi human. Yeah. I, I, I never. Okay, now I, I like Rico in terms of characterization. I think, I think Rico's pretty cool. Um, but he's so, and this is just from a gameplay perspective. He's so slow in combat, and his gear is powerful, but so damn slow, and just not, just not really, doesn't have any kind of usefulness to it, that, like, I never used Rico after I got him. I never really did. Yeah, I mean, same, I mean, he's meant to be the tank. He's got a ton of HP. Oh, yeah. Both both in combat and in his gear. He's meant to be the tank. He's supposed to be the character that absorbs the damage. I just could never get past looking at him and going, oh, that's nice. They gave Blanca a a spot in this game. (laughs) He does look like Blanca. (laughs) He really does, too. You're right. I went, oh, that that was nice of Square to uh, to make a Capcom character a main character in this game. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he, he and if for anybody who's not played the game, yeah, you, you know, you're going to once you come across Rico, you're either going to immediately take a liking to him or you or 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 you're going to be like, "Nah. I'm going to pass." 
for me, it was, I'm going to pass, because I just never clicked with Rico. It was like, eh, he's there. I never used him. I mean, he does have a very sad backstory. He does. Yeah, it ha- and that was with the, uh, he's the son of the Kaiser there, if I remember correctly. Yes, he's the yes. son of, 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 of Sigmund, and which... Given that Sigmund Sigmund shows a total discrimination uh, discrimination towards demi humans to begin with, and so Rico and his mother were banished, uh, if I remember, they, to sort of hide the truth of of his demi humanness, mm-hmm. and sh- she died. This was basically a big, huge secret plot that was influenced by the ethos. Yeah, and, and, and you know the uh, and, and I believe the mother was involved at some point with them. I think that's in perfect words. I think she was involved with them at some point, but um, she died, I believe, from illness, if I remember correctly. Yep. Yeah, she died from illness. They didn't say what illness, but she died from illness, and that left Rico to kind of just take care of himself. So it is kind of, it's, it is, it, it, there is a tragedy there, and there is, you know, it does make you feel for the guy. You know, that's that's definite, you know? But, like, I don't know, it just, I enjoyed his characterization. I, I don't mind the times that he's, you know, he's in my party when he has to be. And I like his dialogue, but there's just something there that... I just said there was just something that wasn't there with him that was with other characters that just you know it it just he was kind of it it just it almost felt like he almost feels like a a side questy type character if that makes any kind of sense to me at least I get I get it it's I mean yeah yeah his his ultimate desire is to just avenge his mother and himself and he he's not I felt that he was a bit too one-dimensional, I, you know, just going along with that. You know, like, all right. He did sort of feel like just a plot point. Like, okay, I have to beat you to advance the story. Yeah. And then after that, and, and you know, and after he joins your party, it's like, okay. He gets a few lines here and there, and, you know, if you have him in your party and whatnot. But it's nothing, nothing yeah. really... You know, he he just sort of has this sort of disinterested um, feel about him, which you know, fine. But if you want narrative, you're not going to get much out of him. No, you're not. And aside from that backstory, it, it just it, the not he did. I guess that's what I'm looking for. He didn't engage me the way the other characters did. I mean, even Choo Choo, who. I can't stand. <laughs> it was the worst character I think in that game, aside apart from Margie. Even Choo Choo, I was somewhat engaged in because of that classic, classic, classic scene. Oh my God, that scene where she turns into a giant Choo Choo <laughs> and takes on a gear by herself. That <laughs> I can't even <laughs> Tropy McTropson <laughs> <laughs> that, that that whole scene Okay. It is and there's a lot of WTF scenes in Xenogears, but that scene I'll never forget it because even when I was even at sixteen years old I remember going, What the flying as I'm playing it because that scene if I had, there was no, it, it just, in my brain, I had not expected anything like that to happen. So when it happened, I'm like, I, I literally, in my brain, I'm just kind of going square. What were you on when you did this scene? <laughs> because, oh my god, it's that scene. And and, and the music was amazing. I mean, uh, the, uh, the name of the tractor in that scene was Flight, which is a classic theme. I love that theme. And just, but just the fact that it was used during a choo-choo scene, 
Oh my god. I don't even know. I can't. I can't. No, I, Brian, take it away. I can't. My brain just died again. <laughs> uh, all right. That's fine. You know, speaking of, of plot holes, um, Hammer. Oh, Hammer. Yeah. Hammer, who's this also a demo human. Um, I just looked at him as this giant sort of rat with glasses. Um, <laughs> Pretty much what he is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, this, this biped rat with glasses. Um, you know, he has this sort of happy go lucky attitude, but he is really, he, he's really a, a very troublesome character. Yeah. He's, he's, you know, functions as sort of like your supplier while you're in the prison. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and he helps you to get out of that prison and, and supplies you with, with intel. Um, he was imprisoned because of the Kaiser's harsh anti-demihuman laws and policies. He also was in prison because he was caught pulling... He was caught being a lying, uh, lying cheat. Yeah. Yeah. So... He somehow... When Faye beats Rico and becomes the gear battling champion... For some reason, and the game never explains this, Hammer 2 gets a full pardon. <laughs> yeah, th that was never actually, that is a plot hole. That was, ne even in Perfect Works, that's not explained. He's an excellent mechanic. Oh, yeah. Um, But you find out that he really has, you know... This sort of happy-go-lucky demeanor is, is a bit of a front, because he really has some deeply rooted sort of psychological issues. He gets jealous very easily. He really, really wants to feel important. He wants to feel needed. And just when he, when he gets the full pardon and joins you, he joins the crew of the Yggdrasil. Um... You start using him less and less. He he just becomes less and less important to the story, and he actually tells you this in game. Yeah, he does. He, he he's just like, I'm just kind of, you know, the handyman there. That, that I don't really mean anything to 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 the overall, you know, to to to, to the the actual plot of what's going on in the story, and. It, if I remember correctly, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember correctly, Hammer and Solaris ends up killing Ellie's Ellie's mom. Yes. Right. Yep. He, and, he goes. Yeah. Keep going. And uh, I'm trying to remember. It, it, this is, it's been so long. And after he kills Ellie's mom, he has like a breakdown because of what he did. Uh. Because he, sh he shot her freaking point blank in the face for crying out loud. I was like, geez. Yep. And the next time... And then you don't see him until, like, near Endgame. And then he's yep. all in that uh that that weird ass gear there that I can't... I couldn't... I remember... I just remember I couldn't stand that fight because it was horrible. But, like, he's all, like, mutated and whatnot uh, because of Krellian... Ooh, I, yeah, well, we'll have to get into Krellian. But yeah, uh, he, he, and even that, even an endgame, this ties into what you were saying, Brian, even an endgame where he was, you know, a part of this gear where he thought he had power and that he was important, he ended up not being important at all. And that was kind of the legacy that he left in that game is, he was the ultimate unimportant person in Xenogears, at least in my view. Yeah, that's you know, looking at the at his his plot summary here. Yes, that that was a big a big thing. Um, he goes with the party to Solaris to gather info and to barter all of the items. Um, but when he's there, he's he's found by Corellan, um, who lures him. Um, who bribes him with a great reward, including fighting power, if he can get Ellie. So you have this this scene where you know the party is just 
of just several steps, just steps away from freedom, where they're trying to escape Solaris, and Hammer just pulls a gun um, on Ellie, and saying that she returns with him. Uh, Ellie's mother, Medina, um, steps in front of the gun, and Hammer shoots. Ha- Hammer shoots uh, Ellie's mother right in the head. Ugh. Um, the party does escape, uh, leaving Hammer behind, and yeah, when he appears again, yeah, um, for his work, he is surgically grafted into the structure of a gear, and he's instructed by Corellan to destroy the party in the, uh, the second of the Anima Dungeons. And, but, in the end, he is defeated, and, um, he decides to, to base, he, he, he falls into a ravine and, and self-destructs himself. So, you know, there's this sort of philosophical, uh, paragraph that Faye, um, says in the narration on disc two. But, yeah, he, 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 he's... Hammer is probably the most tragic of the characters in the game. Yeah, I agree. We've got a lot more to unpack. <laughs> We've got a lot more to unpack. There's a lot of characters, a lot of moments, a lot of what the fuckery still abounds. So, um, we will take a break. You'll have some music. I need to, um, fill my head up with, with happy things and silly things and nonsense instead of Heavy plot and pain and death. <laughs> <laughs> then you don't want Xeno Gears. <laughs> no, you definitely don't. <laughs> this is not a happy game. So we'll take a break. You're listening to the Tanya and Brian show here on downloadable content. 20th anniversary of Xeno Gears. We'll be back. <laughs>
Welcome back to Downloadable Content, talking 20th anniversary of Xeno Gears. We are all still here. I think Tanya was out in the back fixing up her gear. <laughs> I was. I had to get a frame HP. Oh, those are important. Those are absolutely very important. <laughs> very important. Um, so... So yeah, in the first half, you know, we spent a lot of it talking about a lot of the characters, um, and we'll continue that discussion, but also, you know, it's been 20 years since the game came out, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, you know, some just some of the more th memorable things that stick out in our minds, just our personal experiences playing this game. Now, even though I'm... I, you know, don't have a high opinion of Xenogears. There were still moments that really, really stuck out that, you know, will always stick with me, you know, just going forward. And I think, uh, I will start. So one of the, one of the, one of the big, <laughs> now we've mentioned that Square borrowed heavily from the psychological and philosophical teachings of Nietzsche and Carl Jung, and there's Freud in there as well. The whole idea of id and and the super ego and and you know, mm -hmm. just like the backbone of Faye's existence. It's like, hi, Sigmund Freud, how are you? <laughs> yep. The only thing that we don't have is the penis envy. <laughs> oh God, right. <laughs> we, we don't have that, thank God. <laughs> thank the goddess. Then, you know, it's like, Faye and Ellie get romantically involved in the game, which is cute. It is, yeah. It, it's adorable because, you know, and it's actually a romance that develops over the course of the game, you know, if keeping in mind that this relationship started with a gun pointed at Faye's head by Ellie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> By the end of the game, you're gonna you're gonna be screwing each other. <laughs> By the end of the game, a thousand fan fictions, and I actually think <laughs> I, I actually think there's a lot of manga to that effect. Oh, God, I'm sure you can yeah. very easily find Faye and Ellie smut floating about. Uh -huh. Kills me. Well, you know, <laughs> rule thirty four. It's going rule to happen. 34. In, it's it's the internet. Um. But yeah, it borrows a lot from religious uh, r religious ideas. It borrows a lot of philosophy and psychology. Um, it also borrows heavily from science fiction. And we see that in great giant screaming detail when we get to the Soylent area of the game. Oh my god. The Soylent area. Uh. Yeah. Because that doesn't scream uh, the classic movie at all. I mean, you know, even if you hadn't watched the movie, you at least heard of what the Soylent system is. You know, like, it was just it's like ingrained in your consciousness, even when you were a kid. You knew what Soylent was. Yes, you know, the, the joke of, uh, you know, Soylent Green is people. By the greatest people. So you find out that um, there are mutated humans in the game. There's a class of, and they're called the Reapers, um, and they are um, they are used to basically feed the weapon known as Deus. In the yeah. game, these these mutated humans are also called Wells. Wells, yeah. The Wells Reapers. Uh, and, and later on in the game, they're also known as Terminal Interface Weapons. And what the Soylent system is, is, is places where humans are transformed into Wells. And subsequently those wells are turned into food and medicine so I look green as people <laughs> like yes 
Yes, there's no there's no way to sugarcoat that. It's I mean it's called the Soylent system for crying out loud. Um, but um, both Solarians from Solaris and Lambs are unaware of what the Soylent system is or does. I mean Ellie says. Uh, you know, her being a gambler, so she's like, I've heard that the Soylent system is an important system, support system for Solaris, but I don't know much else. Um, so the first purpose of the Soylent system is for the food and medicine that's given to the population, giving them a source of additives to control people's behavior as a way to maintain the seal placed on the populace by limiters. The M plan. Yep. And the second purpose is for the well bodies collected to be used for system deus as part of Gazel Ministry's M plan. Now the Gazel Ministry is a weird bunch. <laughs> <laughs> They're not human. <laughs> They were human once upon a time, but they're not human. They're, they're, they're just, they're, they're in the soul 9000 as bits of data. That's what they are. That's, that's okay. so weird. Now, this might be me, but let, let me let, see, if you, see if you see this. Every time there was a cutscene involving, when it was just the ministry talking amongst themselves. It's just having discussions that threw you for a loop. She had no idea what the fuck they're talking about. Oh, God, especially the first time around. Oh, God, yeah. I always had the scene in my head or any time... Uh, the scene... The scenes, because there were mo mo more of them, most, a lot of them, from the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion when... Uh, what is Shinji's father's name? Um... Oh, God. Um, it begins with a G. Yes, it does. Uh, Gendo. Gendo. Yeah. When he's talking with the board, and the board, they're just represented by these, like, avatars of light with a number on them. Yeah, that's very... Yeah. That was what I thought every time this conversation, these conversations with the Gazel Ministry were going on. Just disembodied voices just out there. But when you find out in the game what the Soylent system is and what it does, I expected Charles Heston... <laughs> To come barreling into the game. <laughs> like the Kool-Aid man. I just envisioned like the Kool-Aid man coming through the wall. <laughs> People! <laughs> and these Soylent system facilities are all over the planet. And they are supervised by the ethos. Yeah. Yeah, it is pretty... It is pretty fucked up when you think about it. Like, it, it's just the way the way that the way it, if if you're if if you're talking about the scene that I think you're talking about when they when uh, when Faye and Co when they first get into the Solaris part of the Solent system, and you know, and, and I think Saiten said something like. You ate that. You ate that food. Remember that for when you go through this door or something like that. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> your 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 stomach drops as soon as you go. Oh shit. <laughs> well, pass the ketchup. Uh, <laughs> Uh, these wells need salt. These wells need salt. Ryan! <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of bland. <laughs> They're kind of... These wells... Alright, I'm gonna have to make a meme about that now. These wells need salt. <laughs> I'm gonna need salt. Have... That was... One up for you, Brian. That was great. Stick that in your in your uh, developer room in, uh, as a patch for uh, your, your game. <laughs> <laughs> These wells need salt. These wells I'm gonna have salt. to put that somewhere now. I'm gonna have to put that somewhere. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh my god, that sounds great, Brian. Tastes like communion wafers. But um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Now that I've now that I've put myself into the ninth level of hell, <laughs> that but yes, that moment when Ellie and Faye realize what Soylent the the, the Soylent is and what they've <laughs> their connection to all of this. <laughs> oh, God. that was I'm like well done. That was a very nice homage square, beautifully done. Beautifully done. So that was that was just one of the the more memorable moments in the game for me. I'm gonna throw one now. I'll put you on the spot. Oh wow, there's so many of them. But I, honestly, uh, the one that sticks out for me right, just like off the top of my head, is uh, when uh, when the party has split up. When they're uh, when Faye and uh, actually when it's just Faye. When you're just controlling Faye. Uh, in his gear in Welthall, and uh, you're going after the fleet, the 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 Ave fleet uh, over by the um, uh, the border guards, I think they were called or something like that. And uh, it was during a it's during the real really the first important mission of the, of the story. And uh, was this Bart, in the desert? Yeah, it was in the desert. Yeah, and okay, and, yeah. and Bart is simultaneously. Uh, Invading, uh, invading the palace to get Shikan, um, you know, as kind of yes, a, okay, yes, yeah, I know now, I know now, okay, yep. So you know, uh, so Faye is, is, you know, he he, you have to get through the, the 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 ships there, and you got to destroy them, and you do that, and uh, and uh, you got this guy Yandercom, I believe that's his name, Yandercom, and uh, he's a moron. You know, he's. I, I. I believe when I first played, I called him in my head General Moron or something like that. So, was you know, he the was he the big hulking? You know, um, has I think markings on his face, has no neck. Uh, that's the guy. Yep. That's the guy. Okay. Yep, Yandercom. He's got that 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 cross type face paint yes. on. Or something yes. Yes. Like yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Yandercom, he's a moron, but you know, he he. I love the interplay. This actually, this basically this whole scene. I love the interplay between him and I guess his first mate there, or whatever, or what, what lieutenant, wherever he was, and the NPC. Where the NPC is basically saying, you know, that all these strategies that Yandercom's coming up with to try to, you know, to try to get you, you know, to try to get you in your gear is outdated and outmoded and 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 all this. And and the NPC there is just he's funny as hell. He's just like. This isn't gonna work. This isn't gonna work. You're a moron. This isn't gonna work. And I remember giggling at that. And then like, you you have to face off against the the confinzel gun. That's what it was. The confinzel's uh, gun, main gun. There, you beat that. That was pretty easy. But then with it transitions into Gandercom getting into a machine called Dora. And I'll never forget this uh, this particular scene because for me it was done so well, and it was so it really got me in the moment of this boss battle coming up. Uh, is when you start it is is just you know you've defeated the fleet, you know you think you've won, uh, you think you know every you know you think Yandercom's done for and everything. And you're standing there in your gear with your with your with your uh, your pirate buddies there, uh, your NPC pirate buddies there, and you're you're just like and I, and I think even one of the NPCs goes, you know, stop the border guards, we smashed them, hell yeah, you know, and then all of a sudden you see it flashes to the Dora's uh, claw type things, and you see and you hear go June June, and Faye's like what the and then you see these light, these beams of laser beams just coming out of the confinesal, uh, the ruins of the confinesal there. And then, you know, it just slowly just bursts out of the confinesal. And then you have the boss music starting. And just the way it was done with the lighting with the, the 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 beams just you know coming out at at, at at with the timing and just it was so perfectly done i was hyped i was like this is 
the real boss that I gotta face off against. And Dora is hard. It is a difficult boss battle. I don't care, you know, if you got the best stuff for your gear, that is a very difficult boss for your gear at, the, at that point in time. And you only have your NPC pirate buddies to, uh, to help you. So I was hyped. I was just that whole that whole build up and then the scene itself where you face off against Adora. I was so hyped for that battle. I was ready. I was just like, let's do this. I'm gonna beat your ass, the Endercom. And uh, I believe that's also a, a, a also a point where Graf comes around and he says. You know, you want the power, does thou desire the power, blah, blah. He does his whole spiel there, and then you get to fight him. But, yeah. Um, I've got the power! I've got the power! But it was great. I loved that scene. It was just, it was very well, very well done and executed, Square. That's how you hype up for a boss battle. So then let me ask you, because his character um, is also in Xenosaga. Um, he fights in a place called, he fights in the Dora. He's in Xenosaga episode one. Mm -hmm. And you, you have the boss called Proto Dora. Yep. <laughs> so nice little, a little homage, you know, later on, like, because I played Xenosaga before I played Xenogears. So I'm looking at Vandercom and I'm going, you look familiar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, 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 it is a different character in Xeno Saga, but you wouldn't know it. You know, like... <laughs> no. You, you wouldn't know it. It, it, it. It's Yandercom. It's just slightly different. But yeah, I, I love that scene. It just, I, I, was, I was hyped. I was ready. And the battle itself was difficult but it, it, I got through it and I remember being really happy when I, I was so satisfied when I beat Dora I was just like yeah yeah I'm, I'm let's do this shit you know so that was definitely a scene for me that stands out one of the characters that I felt needed to have more um, because I, I do enjoy him and, you know, there was, I, I felt a sort of personal, I, I could almost relate to him a little bit, was Billy. Oh, Billy. I love Billy. Billy Lee Black. Um, he is a 16 year old boy. He is a mature, he is a pacifist priest, um, of the ethos. And he is a member of the branch of the ethos which, quotes, cleans and purges the world from the wells. <laughs> now, if you remember, he has a very, very strained relationship with his father, uh, Josiah. Yeah. And... Um, and he learned how, to, and his way, I just, again, he's a priest, he wears cowboy boots, and his weapons of choice are two uh, revolvers. Well, actually, he's also got a, a shotgun. He does. He, he does get yep. the shotgun. Um, I very much think that the character of Junior in Xenosaga is very heavily based on Billy. Oh, Junior, yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Um, the reason, part of the reasons why he he's uh, he's responsible for uh, killing Wells is because his mother was killed by one. Yeah, yeah. his mother was killed by one, and um, so during that attack, he was also saved by um, the bishop, Bishop Stone. Who, ooh, ooh, he pisses me off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he pisses me off. And so, what was very sort of heartbreaking um, was, you know, you, you meet him on, on the, uh, the Thames. 
I'm using the British pronunciation. I don't know if it's, <laughs> I don't know if it's pronounced, if it's, if it's supposed to be Thames, but when I see the, the, the ship, uh, when I saw the ship, I'm like, oh, it's the Thames <laughs> named after the <laughs> I say name. Thames, but that's me though. Yeah. But you know, again, the game doesn't give an official pronunciation, so I'm just calling it the name of the river in, yeah. in, in, in England. But when you find out that, you know, he looks up to Bishop Stone, and when you find uh, that Stone never really cared for Billy at all, and just used Billy to strike back at his father... Oh. Um, you know, this boy who is, who very much is, is this devout figure, very, you know, sort of pacifist figure, um, seeing his mentor basically destroy his faith right in front of him, and also kills one of Billy's friends. Yeah. Um, it's like, oh... It's 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 that moment where you you find that your faith, which you've put so much comfort in, is shattered. It's like, ouch! And you know, it, it's it's sort of you know, I I could kind of relate to that. Um, you know, I became an atheist because you know I I just came to the realization that religion as a whole um, does so much more harm than good, but that's an entirely different discussion. <laughs> um, you want to talk about being here for hours, I do have opinions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> after all of that, uh, after all of this revel revel all, all these revelations, and he... His relationship with his father greatly improves about uh, after that. And, you know, once, I mean, unfortunately, after his role in the story is over, he, he becomes relegated to side character. Yeah, it's really sad, too, because I like Billy. So do I. I'm just like... He sort of reminds me, he sort of that whole reminds me of uh, what the, one of my favorite characters in Mass Effect, Thane Krios. Oh, good. Oh, that's a great character. Yeah. Who, again, after his part in the, in the Mass Effect story is over, he just sort of becomes relegated to, you know, side character. Use what, you know, whatever. But the, the moment uh, in that game where... His faith is shattered. Uh, just, that that was a painful moment. Yeah. And and and, and wasn't it? And correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but wasn't it? Um, that when you finally face Stone, isn't Stone like all mutated and crazy looking? And 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 then he and then during and then like during the boss fight with um. Oh, what's he? What's he driving there? Alk and Shell, I think that's what it was. Um, that uh, very good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm remembering now. Very uh, good. But uh, during the boss fight with Alk and Shell, isn't uh, isn't that he finally lets? Uh, isn't that when he finally lets Billy know the whole truth about that he's the one that uh, orchestrated the killing of his mom and all that? Yes. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. that's some that, that that's some tragic shit right there, man. Ugh. Yeah, and um, he 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 reveals his true face, and um, during the battle with uh, after you beat Stone the first time, in comes Gruff again. <laughs> <laughs> Does thou desire the power? <laughs> He offers Stone the power. <laughs> the power in the form of a syringe. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, and Stone gets the upper hand, but Jesse appears, Josiah appears to save the day, um, and they finally get, you know, kill Stone once and for all, and now that, you know, 
his relationship with his father is restored after, you know, being estranged, estranged for so long. And, you know, that was very nice to see, but man, he gets put through the ringer. He really does, uh, Brian. And like, just, I mean, I mean, like you said, you know, having his face shattered right before his eyes. Stone orchestrated the killing of his mother. Stone was the one who got him to kill Wells. It, 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 you know, thinking he was doing something noble and, and good when in actuality he's really killing people when you when you boil it down. It, it's Stone's. Uh, uh, you're you're absolutely you hit you hit it spot on early when you said that. You know, you you came to really just like you are all in and hating that character. I too, I share that. Stone, you just you wanted to just destroy that. Oh, what an asshole. Uh huh. Uh huh. And which to me makes Stone one of the more sort of realistic enemies of the game because, you know, you, we we feel that you, you might, we know people like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. It's like we know, you know, assholes like that, seemingly. It just, it, he felt sort of, you know, much more realistic than most of the antagonists, like Vandercom. He's just, you know, I will kill everything with cannons. And <laughs> That's a good way know, to summarize him, let me tell you. <laughs> you, know, you know, the only way to stop a, you, you need a good guy with a cannon. Um, oh, God. And, you know, Vandercom is just, you know, I'm, e I'm just, I, I cannons, give them all. You know, Shikan, uh, okay, fine. And then, you know, then you get to obviously, you know, to the second disc where just, whoo hoo hoo uh, you start talking about things like the wave existence and the oh. Zohar and Deus and, you know, we haven't even spoken about, uh, we have uh, Ramses and uh, Miang, or Miang. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it- yeah, Ramses, he's a... Uh, he has quite an arc over the game. I will say that. He, he has quite an interesting arc over the game. Um, I mean, I'm curious what you think about him, because, uh, I mean, I know... I mean, I, I mean I, I'm a huge fan of, obviously, the game, but I'm curious to what you think about him in terms of, uh, of a critique uh, about his characterization, because he does have quite a wide, expansive arc in that game. He is all over the place. <laughs> yeah. He's... Whew. My, uh... Oh, he, when I first... Uh, I mean, he's obviously, to me, he's, he's, he's obviously, like, the jealous prick of the game. Yeah. Um. He... You know, he, he was supposed to be the he was supposed to be the uh, the character that Faye became. He was supposed to be the uh, the contact. Um, and when you find out that you know a lot of his motivations are as a result of just basically having a massive inferiority complex, oh. he reminded me very. His characterization reminded me. very very, very much of Liquid Snake from the first Metal Gear Solid. Just, you know, because Liquid Snake in Metal Gear Solid is going on and on about how Solid Snake got all of the the dominant genes and was always, you know, the best of everything, you know, living in his shadow and... Ramses is a, very much the same. He's lived his entire life uh, always being passed over for Faye. And he deals very, he's very, you know, it, and it drives him to insanity. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's weird watching, you know, as, as, you, as you have more and more scenes with Ramses and you know, and tell me if you agree. The more you see him, 
the more unstable he gets. And, like... You know, and then it culminates, obviously, in, in, in Endgame, where, you know, you face off with him one last time, and, like... You know, then he goes into real detail about, you know, why he feels the way, he, why he's so obsessed with Bay, And that's because, you know, he was trying really hard to hold on to uh, his own, I guess you could say, his, his own self-worth. And with Bay around, with Bay just Faye, even Faye's existence, you know, it denied him of his self-worth. So actually, there's a very big message in there about you know, basing your self-worth on other people. And in this case, it's Ramses basing, basing his self-worth on Bay. And uh, I, I think that's a powerful message. Uh, you know, and, and, and that, 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 that's a very powerful... There's, there's a lot of powerful scenes with Ramses in them, but, like, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about uh, when you face off with them the last time and just, like, how he goes into detail about how Faye is, uh, in the, um, how, how Faye is the, how, how, how he learns that Faye is the contact, and that, uh, and that as he's, and that as Ramses is being grown in the lab, that, uh, you know, Krellian and, uh, Miang are, you know, in, in Faye's mom's body, I might add, is, like, they're saying that, you know, now that Faye is the contact and it's been confirmed, that he's that Ramses is trash. That was that was the big thing with Ramses, is that everybody yes. called him trash. Yep. And I remember that and I just even though he was an antagonist and an enemy, I fell for him. And Yeah, he was. He was he was very sort of humanizing because you know the dynamic between him and Faye sort of makes me think of sibling rivalry taken to its most extreme. Yeah, I agree with that, absolutely. Like, when you have one parent that completely favors one one of their children over the other. <laughs> I know what that feels like. I mean, you're not on a you're not out on a killing spree yet, but <laughs> no, no. If I need to do that, I I put up GTA Five. <laughs> you're not on a killing spree yet, so um, so when you find you because when you see him initially, you initially just think, oh, he's another megalomaniac. I mean, that's what my interpret my impression of him was for hours. Yeah, like because it was always the Ramses and Miang show, because you always usually fought them together. Yeah, um, yeah, and it was just oh, another couple of megalomaniacs. But you find out you know how important Miang actually is, and Ramses is just he he was manipulated the entire time. And when you get that expo dump on you, like, oh. And it's like, oh. yeah, I agree. It's like, oh, shit. So that's why he's like that. Okay, you know? <laughs> I mean, you're not forgiven. No, no, God, no. But it's understandable, though. Yes. And the fact that he loses every single time you face him. He was one of those characters, though, that the game does not really tell you what his fate is. Because he doesn't die. No, he doesn't. Um, but actually, in Perfect Works, you do find out. Ah! So what does happen to him? Uh, basically, what happens is, is that, um, from what I remember, and mind you, this was years ago when I read this, but... From what I remember, I believe that uh, Faye faces Ramses one on one, a duel, uh, a duel just as not like friends, but as respected individuals, as respected fighters, um, and uh, they kind of bury the hatchet. Him and him and Faye, not not like all the way, obviously, because it's you know it's kind of like a 
too much happens, you can't go home type deal, but, you know, they do kind of bury the hatchet with each other, and, uh, Ramses, uh, goes on, uh, with the elements, which we haven't gone into yet, but with, with the former elements, uh, uh, of those ladies there, he goes on with them, and, uh, I guess, according to what I remember, I guess they just kind of live life after that, um, he tries to better himself, and, uh, there's, and, and it's not confirmed in Perfect Works, but I believe that there is a, a fan theory out there that, uh, that him and, um, uh, what's her name, um, Dominia are together at that point, at the okay. end, yeah, so, I mean, you know, it, it, he does, he, he does, uh, come to grips with himself, Towards Endgame, and uh, the elements they ha they help him out with that. But you know, after and after the game is over with, yeah, he does face off against Faye one more time, but as respected as a respected opponent, pretty much as somebody that he doesn't want to kill anymore. He doesn't have an obsession with anymore. But yeah, it, it it's he had to hit rock bottom before that could happen. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh, but now the elements, I, 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 I'm sure you remember the elements, uh, you know, especially that one particular scene where uh, they basically, where Square basically did their version of Power Rangers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I love that scene. I know it's corny, but I love that scene. I love that whole coming together thing uh where the elements they bring their gears together and they form g elements i think it's called that that's their that's their their gear there i almost said zord but yeah that's that's their gear there <laughs> and it, it just i love that scene but I, I i i i actually like the elements in terms of uh who they were as characters i kind of i kind of enjoyed that um kind of a little I thought that was, I thought that was a nod to uh, to actually to previous Final Fantasies like the Four Fiends of Elements and all that. I think that was kind of a, a subtle nod to that. I could see that. I, I could see that. I mean, it just to remind you that yes, this is a Square game. <laughs> yeah, you know, a little product placement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's like oh, by the way. But yes, by the way. Um, but, you know, the whole second disc, which, mm. yes, you know, all of the action on the first disc, and then to be confronted with narration, with bits of interactive game. You could tell that that's where, that's where they got their budget cut off, and that's where... I believe, and I could be wrong about this, I believe it was, wasn't it Final Fantasy VIII where most of the budget went into at that point, and that's where I got cut off? I could I could be wrong about that, but I think it was FF8 where... I believe, you, I believe you're right. I think FF8 was in development at that time, and also Square had only given Takahashi and his group two years. Yeah, and they were coming was, up on it. They were coming up on it, and um, Kotaku actually interviewed uh takahashi last year um, oh there's an art that yeah uh, they interviewed takahashi a year ago and it's on kotaku's website and they asked takahashi what the hell was with disc two <laughs> <laughs> so um the interviewer asked him and takahashi said i'm, I'm now quoting directly from the article um, he said, quote, Honestly speaking, what had happened is that Xenogears as a project was staffed pretty much entirely out of new staff members, young staff members. Back then, we had the direction of all projects take two years and that's when we need to get it done. So on top of developing the game, we had to nurture and teach and grow these younger employees. Things like 3D were extremely new, which led to some delays in the schedule. Ultimately, it just wasn't possible to get everything done. Oh, it's so, and that that is so sad because 
if they had done, if they had been able to manage to do disc two, like disc one, oh my goddess, I, I can't even fathom how it, it, it would elevate it to true masterpiece status. It really would. So, you know, the urban legend of, you know, budget cuts and time constraints, that was, you know, that was partially to blame as well. I mean, Xeno Saga, Xeno Gears is an unfinished game. I mean, it is. there's no, there is no way, there's no other way to describe it. It is an unfinished game because Square uh, wouldn't allow them to finish it. They said, you have two years, that's it. And, and, and you know, I, and and the the outcry from fans is, is when it comes to this too is, you know, they a lot, there's been petitions and so forth for Square, Square Enix now to redo. To, when they remaster, because because I think everybody knows it's probably going to be a remaster of Xenogears at some point, and an HD remaster at some point, and the 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 request is. You know, for Z for for Square to fix Dix Dix Two, to finally put in the gameplay that should have been, uh, whether it, whether for a remaster or even a remake of Xeno Gears. You know, and on and on as and you know, this is just an, as an aside, but I would love to see an HD remake of Xeno Gears. I think that'd be freaking amazing. But I mean, yeah, uh, you know. You have hour. What is it like? Hour, hour and a half long cutscenes in Disc Two, broken up by like you said, tad bits of, of of dungeon gameplay here and there, and a boss once in a while, and that's kind of about it. Yeah, there's there's a lot of of reading. That's why I, you know, second disc really feels like a textbook. And yes, there the narration and, and some of the cutscenes go so long that you get asked, "Do you want to save?" This was a practice that carried over into Xena Saga. <laughs> <laughs> now I see where it came from. But the sec the story, the plot on the second disc, really, you really have to pay attention because when you when we start really diving into all of the different personas and incarnations of Faye, of Ellie of Miang, of Faye's father. It is, you need a flowchart. <laughs> you, you, you do, and, and it's true. I mean, not, not to say, at least in my, in, my, in my view, the story itself is amazing. It really is. But if it was, if it, if it was just broken up into actual gameplay aspects and it because you know the old adage is show not tell try to show as much as you can obviously they couldn't uh for various reasons but if they were able to show what the narration was i i, I think that would have gone a long way towards uh for, for for a lot of people a long way towards uh, being able to consume the story better and I am able to understand it all better because honestly and it and I, I consider myself a, a, a pretty bright individual. It took me two times to play that game through before I finally figured it all out. And then I had to read perfect works in order to actually get it all. <laughs> so I mean especially the second disc. That second disc it's it's a wallop. It really is. If you don't pay careful attention, you're gonna get lost. Yeah, and you know that was the compromise Takahashi and and his managers at Square came up with was that okay we don't have we're not going to get additional time and money so that that was the compromise. And I, I guess I mean look at it from his standpoint because I mean again I'm a game dev so I, I hear that, but like looking at it from his standpoint I get it, and for what they had and we were able to work with, I mean. Yeah, it's a very different. It's extru it's 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 like you said, night and day from from disc one. But considering what they had to work with and considering what was going on at the time, I, I'm just glad they were able to get all of that story out. And and I'm glad we were able to get the end game content that we did at least. At least, you know, the final dungeon and all that. You know, was I mean, 
I, I mean, honestly, I hate the final dungeon in that game because, well, it's way too complex. But anyway, but the uh, at least the end game content was was worth it, you know, and and the final boss, the final boss, Deus, was worth it, and it was just the ending itself was satisfying uh, to some extent. Uh, you know, of course, I want sequels because. Of course I want sequels. But yeah, it, it, you know, it, for what it was, just to, I understand the necessity for it. Doesn't mean we have to like it, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's see. You, you mean, Kassarath just put out uh, Sanctus Mortem, and you obviously don't have the staff or the budget <laughs> that Square, <laughs> that Square is able, like, Takahashi had a staff of 30 people working on Xenogears when it was officially in development. Now, I'm assuming that you did the bulk of the programming for Sanctus Mortem yourself. I did. I, I, about 90% of the game is me. Um, I, 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 a lot of the graphics and a lot of the, uh, you know, the graphic design work and all that was was done by other was done by third parties um but pretty much the game is me it's pretty that was pretty much a one woman dev right there for sanctus mortem <laughs> so it's like you don't i mean you have you know you're the programmer i mean you have obviously somebody writing dialogue somebody you know you, yeah you so and Let's see. I'm trying to remember because the last game I tested was 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 uh, Chronicles of a Dark Lord, the the remaster. So the time between that and Sanctus Mortem, but it's like when you're just a a small studio like Kassaris is, like development time is a, is a real thing. Oh God! I mean, I actually did the I actually did I, I chronicled the time from when I first started the game and when I released it when it was released and it was a year and a half of my life i wrote everything i wrote the entire story i did all the design work i did all the eventing i i, I did i did the programming i put in the plugins that i needed you name it i did it i did all the databasing so it's like but you don't need a translator <laughs> no thankfully but <laughs> you know but 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 see but but tying it into what takahashi had to deal with I, I get it. I totally get it, and I get what kind of pressure he was under at that point in time. Because, I mean, you get a two-year deadline to do a ma and it really is a massive game like Xenogears. I don't even know how we got what we got. To be quite honest with you, I don't know how they managed it, especially with an, an, a, a team of people unfamiliar with 3D because it was so new and unfamiliar with, with, with just game design in general. I, I just I don't know how they managed it, and it's really it's really a feat when you think about it, and it's a testament to Takahashi and his direction that he was able to put out what he was able to put out. And I I I think that if this two could just be fixed, if it could be if it could include the show instead of tell type gameplay, if it could show that story, if it could have more gameplay like the first disc if it could actually be fixed then the game would be as near perfect as i could possibly imagine it well you get on that you petition square and <laughs> and and get to it because oh i've signed my name five times to five different positions and it hasn't gone anywhere yet so. all right well you know keep trying you know and just another note on, on the development of this game just we, you know, nowadays, like, we have, we, you know, we got the release of Final Fantasy XV last year, and that was in development for ten years. Oh. Kingdom Hearts Three is about to come out, possibly, allegedly. I still think it's vaporware. <laughs> There's a release date now, though. <laughs> uh huh. Sure. Um. Yeah. If you, if you, if you believe their lies, but um. <laughs> uh. <laughs> So the fact that, you know, going back to 20 years ago, play, PlayStation 1, just the idea of a two-year development cycle 
is baffling to me, given that we've had these two major games. Given that we've had, you know, the, the last major Final Fantasy taking a decade or more. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it really goes to show you that that arbitrary time period, that arbitrary deadline, it, uh, it makes you wonder. It makes you go, are, were they, what they smoking? What were they smoking, given that kind of a deadline? Two years for a massive game like Xenogears? And, and today, that game would probably have needed at least at least five, if not seven. And very, very probably for for all this stuff. And I, and I and I think that I probably would have had a, a much better opinion of the game if they were able to actually finish. If they were ac- able actually to finish it. Yeah. If it was able, if it and, and it and it really is an unfinished game, I, and I really hope that they actually come to finish it one day. But like tying it into Sanctus, actually, because this is, this is very relevant, is that the uh, is that my game is about eh, about fifteen hours long, give or take, depending on your play style. So fifteen hours. That's that's not even the first disc of Xeno Gears. That's like the first couple of sections of Xeno Gears, and that's pretty much it. Seemingly, but, yeah. But um, I've had but I've had a few people already comment, uh, customers already comment that um, that they find Sanctus Mortem to be like a condensed Xenogear, so to speak. Just you know, very different. Obviously, the plot is extremely different. But you know, but that um, it has you know uh, some homages, some callbacks, whatnot. But like it presents the story in a very you know, kind of a easier to digest fashion uh, from what I was, what I've been told, which is great for me. And um, but that ties into the fact that uh, some people do find Xeno Gears, uh, you know, especially the writing, to be pretentious, to be long-winded. Um, you know, and I, I won't deny that because. Um, I mean, even I, especially in very, very long cutscenes on disc two, I mean, I, I find myself as a dev today going, yeah, that could have been shortened like this, or that could have been shortened like that, or that could have been digested like this instead of like that, you know, and I get that they were under the gun, but, it, you know, they, they, did, they did make some questionable design choices that if they had done it differently... Yeah, they were under the gun, and they had they had to cut stuff, but they still could have maybe presented it in a different way that might have been a little more palatable in disc two. At least I think so. Um, but then again, I'm no Takahashi, so I mean I couldn't tell you. But I mean, for what it is, and it's just my final thought on that. But for what it is, is I created Sanctus Mortem as. Because it was it's heavily inspired by Xenogears and Xenosaga, I might add. And apparently, according to John, there's also Xenoblade in there too. But I had no idea about Xenoblade because I've only played it like a little bit. So, yeah, that was kind of funny. But I did Sanctus Mortem as kind of my my Xenogears, so to speak. It's not anywhere near as long. I didn't want it to be that long. I just wanted to tell the story that was in my head, and I wanted to get it out. And I did that. But I also wanted it to kind of be a tribute to Xenogears and kind of be like, you know, Takahashi, I appreciate what you did. I appreciate the game that you put out. And I wanted to put my game out as kind of a tribute to yours, but also as its own as its own beast. And I wanted to kind of show that, okay, you can do a Xenogears in today's day and age without doing a Xenogears with some of the drawbacks that were very obvious, especially in Disc 2. That's what I have to say about that. No. There you go. And we have it. We have, you know, a couple minutes left. I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to playing Sanctus Mortem, you know, soon. That is on my two-play list. It's sitting in my Steam library. It's installed. It's ready to go. <laughs> we just uh, get Hollow Knight out of the way, and uh, Hollow we'll, Knight. we'll go for- Go from there. We've got a few minutes left. I want to throw some love at uh, Yasunori Mitsuda for his soundtrack to this game. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, it's 
it's for for what we got, it's a it's a full two disc soundtrack. It's was I think this might have been his second or th- no, this was his. Uh, I forget how, what what order this was in because I know he had done Chrono Trigger. He he'd also done he was doing Chrono Cross. Uh, I think he just, what I can't. I, I could have sworn he did another game before Xeno Gears. I can't remember what the hell it was, though. I know he did Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross. Was there another game that he did, too, before that? I can't think. I can't for the life of me remember. I, I, either way, um, it's, you know, for, for as long as the game is, and he wrote a lot of music for Xeno Gears. I mean, the first disc is 25 tracks. It's a very sort of atmospheric soundtrack Mm -hmm. what I mean what I mean by that is each piece most piece fits they fit very well to the what to the moment in the game which is what you want obviously out of a video game composer you want the music to match Mm -hmm. um my favorite tracks on the game are the vocal tracks that are sung by Joanne Hogg which uh stars of tears which is the theme that you hear on the world map. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, that actually does have words to it. You don't hear them in-game. Um, there's also a piece, at the, it's the last piece on the soundtrack called Small Two of Pieces, Broken Shards. That's one of my um, favorites. Love that one. Um, I regularly use the battle music and the boss music in my D&D games. <laughs> yeah. There was another track that's that sticks out. It's the it's the soundtrack of for when you're in the desert town. Oh, um, um, Dazel. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I was. It's I I I love that piece because it fit. It's it's like you really felt that you were in you know so even like um, you know, a stare you know what you're what you think of as a desert town. Yeah. Absolutely, it it had. It, uh, Masuda is he, he's a he's a freaking genius. Just we'll just say it, I mean, genius, absolute genius. Yeah, and you mentioned the uh, the Groff theme, one of my one of my personal favorites. I I love um, I also love Flight. That's a huge classic of mine. I love Flight. Mm, the the final themes here for when you're fighting for Deus and. What the hell's the, the final form of Meong? What's it's oh, like, Eurobolus? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like I, I'm like I know it's some sort of long sounding name. There we go. Love those pieces. Oh, uh, Awakening is uh that's the one for for Deus when you're fighting Deus. That's I love yep. Awakening. Great theme. Great theme. While it's in my head, the first battle with Deus, when you fight his larval form, mm-hmm. um, when you first got there, when I first got there, and you know you're you know you're seeing this Deus for the first time, my first thought was, "This is it." <laughs> Same here. <laughs> this is what we've been building toward. This is God. Okay. <laughs> uh, something right here. Like I'm expecting a four-part boss. Oh yeah, I was too. I was expecting like final boss material there, you know. I, I I'm like okay, I'm waiting for like the parasite Eve thing to happen, where it's like okay, we're starting off with a larva, and then it just becomes this hulking thing <laughs> by the end of it. No, it just it, it, it and actually that was wasn't that the fight where you didn't where, where you where you basically couldn't do anything? You just had to let let the let the boss kill itself until you until you. So it whittles its HP down to like barely anything. Then you killed it. I forget. Actually, I think because, I think that I think that was it. Because I considered that battle to be so insignificant. Like, okay, <laughs> all right, you know, and you know, it is. I mean, Deus, the the, the final form of Deus. Uh, it is. You know, it's technically. The second to last boss, but you know, Arabolus is very easy. Oh yeah, that that that's a gimme fight. That that's that is absolutely a gimme fight. It's uh, it's part uh, it 
and Square does this. Square does this a lot. They will have, like, the second to last boss, which is, you know, technically the, f- you know, which is, it, it, it makes it feel like a final boss. Mm-hmm. But then, but then the last one, the boss immediately after that is a gimme. It's like, it reminds me, Final Fantasy X, where yeah. you have, uh, Ject, uh, and then you have Yuyevin. Which you cannot die at the U. <laughs> I hate you, Evan. Uh, whenever I, somebody says, "What's the final boss of Final Fantasy X?" I always say, "Jacked." I always say, "Brass to final lay on, uh, final lay on." Yeah, that that's that's the final that's the final boss because you, Evan, it, you have auto life. Every character is. Yeah, you can't die. So how is that a boss? You know. <laughs> but although although Deus is an interesting just yeah. The, the the when you first see Deus and Faye just says, "This is Deus." Yes, Faye, we are all you at this moment in time. <laughs> True. <laughs> like the symbolism of Deus, though, the fact that it is a man-made god. There, there's layers upon layers of symbolism there. <laughs> oh, gods, yeah, gods, yes. That's like. Well, don't you look pretty? <laughs> I, I remember. Oh, actually, let me ask you, Brian. Did you um, did you uh, go and defeat the pillars first, or go directly for Deus? I I be- defeated the pillars first. Okay, yeah, me too. Yeah. I've played enough games where if you don't do the thing that the game suggests you do, you're gonna have a bad time. <laughs> You should have pizza it when <laughs> I've play- I I'm not stupid. I've played enough games where if you don't do the thing to, you know, make yourself have a little bit of an easier time, you're gonna walk in and just <laughs> done. Oh god. Especially that um that one attack from one of the uh pillar from, from one I think I think it's either Harlow to Marlow to something like that, where um it takes away your fuel. I was like, ah, I I just I said nope. I'm gonna I'm going to defeat the four pillars and make it a little easier on myself. For example, I'm looking at the Deus uh, fight now. If you defeat the four pillars before you attack Deus, um, Deus starts off with forty thousand HP. Quite a bit. If you don't defeat them. It has 75,000 and has its full range of attacks. Yeah, that's not fun. <laughs> so, you know, just... <laughs> I decided to do the thing and you know, make it a little little easier on myself. So. so, after 20 years, does this game hold up for you? Well, I I actually um, for the twentieth anniversary, and also because I was I ju- I just got done playing, I just got done you know designing, testing, and all that Sanctus Mortem. I decided to go back, so I actually restarted another playthrough of uh, Xeno Gears. Uh, I'm about hmm, almost to the end of the first disc, and uh, I can say that. There are elements of the game that still hold up to this day, but the entire game does not. Um, especially the second disc. The second disc just does not hold up to this day. And that's coming from somebody who thinks it's a masterpiece. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I can I can see that. I mean, I once I finished Xenogears, I was so annoyed by it. That I sold the game immediately. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh Brian. <laughs> I, I'm I'm sorry. I was so put off by it. I just went, nope. I can't have this anymore, and I sold it. I sold it. So for me, for me, uh, no. <laughs> uh, th- I mean, game dev obviously has gotten so much better. Oh yeah. Oh god. It has yeah. it has gotten so much better. So. If Xena Saga, uh, if Xeno Gears was remade, you know, if they did a lot of cleanup and 
Takahashi is able to tell the story that he actually wanted to tell with the technology that is now available that he didn't have 20 years ago, I would give it another shot. And that's and that's amazing. That's amazing to hear. And I and I, and I hope I'm crossing my fingers that one day that will happen. One day Xenogears will get the 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 HD treatment and it'll be remade it'll be it not yet might be a remaster it'll be remade it'll be a remake of xenogears from the ground up and I, I i can only hope that that'll happen one day because i think especially with today's graphics i think it would look amazing i i, I would think that to do it justice though square would have to relinquish the rights to xenogears back to takahashi and i don't know if they're gonna i don't think they'd be willing to do that i know or or or, or maybe if or, or i mean I have been seeing Square do this lately. Maybe they'll do a partnership. Maybe. I mean, Maybe. I haven't seen collaborations lately, so you never know. Maybe, but you know, in the meantime, if you want to, uh, if you want to beat up Deus a bit, just play Chrono Trigger and then beat up Lavos. They're practically the same boss. <laughs> <laughs> Space <League. laughs> Yep. Basically. Basically, so do you have any final thoughts on Xenogears before we wrap this up? Well, um, my, my final thought on Xenogears is just that uh, it's very dear. It's a game that will always be dear to me. Hell, I made a game that was inspired by it. So for me, it holds a very special place in my heart, always will. Um, and that if you want to experience an epic, a truly epic story, even with its flaws, and they are... And there are myriad flaws, especially with today's sensibilities in mind. You can't go wrong with Xeno Gears. You really can't. Um, it's a, it's a, it is a masterpiece of the PS1 era for a reason. Um, and uh, if you want to have a condensed and more modern version of a Xeno Gears, try Sanctus Mortem. <laughs> there was the plug. I was waiting for that. <laughs> I mean, I don't make any money off this. I'm no longer an employee of, of Kassarth, so <laughs> haha. ha um, So this is not a paid advertisement. No, that was um, a plug. <laughs> that was a plug. So while you're plugging away, uh, what platforms is uh, Sanctus Mortem available out, uh, is it out on? Uh, PC, Mac, Linux, and in about a week or two, it'll be, it'll be Android as well. So by the time this recording goes up, it'll probably be available on the mobile platforms. So it's uh, there you go. If uh, out there on the internet, want you want to pick up this game, go get it. Thank you. Go get it. Show show, show some indie devs some love. That's what we do. We 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 we, we take what's there and we uh, kind of turn it on its head. And yes, I have. I yes, it might be inspired by Xeno Gears, but I turned it on its head. Yes. Good. 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 <laughs> so. If any of you out there on the wide world of the internet have any questions, thoughts, comments on this episode or any other episode of downloadable content, let us know on our website, dlcpodcast.com. Use the feedback button. Um, you can also check out up upcoming recordings. All episodes can be found on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, and Google Play Music. Uh, you can also message us or like the Facebook page, downloadable content, uh, and you can also on Twitter at DL Content. So, all there, all the different ways to get downloadable content into your ears. So, on that fun note, all it remains for me to do is to thank Tanya for spending the last two hours of her life talking about Xenogears. You're most welcome. I had enjoyed myself. Thank you. Hopefully you'll be on before too long now that this now that development has wrapped up and you'll have some life back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you'll have some life back, so excellent. Alright. On that note, everyone, I am Brian. Have a good one. Your fingertips moving gently to my the force of life goes on and on The song remains like a haunting melody Of angel music held in chains And I ask you, can we ease the pain of those who love? Can we know the 
broken bones.